how can people best communicate with you to make it more efficient and where they're using, you know, your time wisely? And does that make sense? Yes, but here, here's the thing. I, and I may be unique in this, I want my client to tell me everything they think is important, okay? Because it almost always is. It may not be that important right that minute, but it almost always comes back to being important. And if it's important to them, it needs to be important to me. So I'll get stories that don't impact the settlement all day long, but it gives me tremendous insight into the opposing party. And with that insight, it helps me craft a negotiation strategy. Okay, let's say we've got a very pro, let me give you a concrete example. Mm -hmm. Let's say the, uh, my client is describing Lucy and the other spouse is like Lucy with a football and when Charlie Brown comes to kick it, she moves it. Right? Or always, the, you've heard in family therapy that one spouse is always moving the goalpost. Here's the goal. And I meet the goal, and then the goal moves. All right? So if you get a person like that, it may be beneficial to play some of the exact same games. We call that mirroring their tactics and just let them know that we're not going to get frustrated. We're not going to get um, impatient. We're not going to be emotionally destabilized, which is the goal of most negative negotiating tactics. So we want to react to anything done with as few words as possible. Right? So where I'm going with that is when representing a spouse, divorcing a true, true narcissist, we need to spend that time together. No detail is too small because when we craft as lawyers, when we craft our recommendation, many times it's about the emotional aspects of the divorce, much more important than the financial because it is, especially with narcissists, much more of an emotional transaction than it is a financial. And so to some extent, we're in a game, so we might as well play it well. And the best way an experienced family lawyer can help a client is to know those boring details, to listen, hear the stories. Now, in terms of methods of communicating, one of my favorite tools is because I'm a visual learner. And most male lawyers are visual learners. And that's how they teach you in law school. You read, you go to class, you talk about what you read, and then you handwrite notes. And so all your thoughts are translated into words. Same thing in the courtroom. To be an effective trial lawyer, you have to be able to think, write, and speak about three different topics at one time. But two of those are visual. So my point is, I love to have my clients write detailed narratives telling me what happened, how they thought about it, and how they thought their spouse thought about it, and what any other witnesses thought about it. And then I can, over a cigar, read that at, at my leisure. And what I'm going to do, and I don't care if it's 35 pages, single-spaced Words. I'm going to read every word of it, and I'm going to highlight what's important for me to follow up with the client about, because how they felt about a particular problem could be just as important as the problem itself, which is key to therapy and counseling. And 10 of the points that I come up with, oh, you need to tell your therapist about this, okay, because this was awful. And, and that's what I think it's lost the most in all the discussions about narcissistic abuse and financial abuse. A lot of times it is horrific. You know, it could be uh, something as simple as, well, I need to go to Birmingham for my aunt's funeral. Well, no, it's not in the budget. What do you mean it's not in the budget? Well, we don't, it's not in the budget for gas, so you can't go. No, 
I mean, what what if that's your your mother's closest sibling ever got to be there? So that when we talk about financial abuse, when we talk about the emotional abuse, it usually turns into some really bad, bad stuff because that will just kill you and having to deal with that. So, and usually it's been successful by the time they, at some level, and so usually a deep level by the time they get to me. So we'll do my, that in therapy. And we'll also ask, how did you feel in your body when it was experienced? Yeah. That body yeah. sensation can, a lot, can almost be more impactful than the, the feelings because trauma is stored in the body. Yeah. And I, I have no training on that. I, I, mm-hmm. I know what stress feels like. I have stress a lot. Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> Especially when judges uh, disagree with my legal analysis. And why would they disagree with me? You know, that's ridiculous. But yeah. And so I can't even begin to help them recover from that. But I can help them in terms of the emotional aspects of the negotiating process, which, like I said, often is more important to understand than the financial. And you may like this. So one of the things, one of the tactics and tools I like to use is if my client is in counseling and therapy, I want to call the therapist. I'm going to get a release from the, uh, you know, on the therapist form, releasing uh, the communications to me. Okay. And I got two simple questions. How's my client doing? And what do you want me to know? And 90% of the time I make that call, I learn something terribly important and terribly helpful. And it's ridiculous. It's so simple. And that's one of the things that I always share with other lawyers who care what my opinion is. It's just a great tactic and tool to have. Almost every time I learn something that is ridiculously helpful and that phone call could could be 10 minutes, could be five minutes, could be half an hour. I've never had a mental health professional waste my time, promise you. 